coming out of the rain, late autumn, early winter, whatever we have uh, for this hearing on low wage work. Um, I'm John Garlock. I chair the Education Committee of the Rochester Labor Council. And with me here is Bill McCoy from Metro Justice, and we're the uh, moderators, facilitators for this session. Um, the hearing sponsors the Labor Council, the Pattonville Labor Education Fund, Metro Justice, the Worker Center, and Power. Um, hope that this event will heighten awareness of low-wage work, contribute to an ongoing discussion of the issues, and lead to actions to improve the condition of low-wage workers. The first session, we're going to try to figure out what low-wage work is. On a Saturday morning, we're going to have low-wage workers talk about doing low-wage work. On a Saturday afternoon, we're going to address the question of, so what do we do about it? Um, please turn off your cell phone. Thank you for the reminder. I'm not good at remembering that because I don't have one, but yeah. So we have three presenters uh, this afternoon. I'll introduce them. They're here and they will come up and make their presentation from the front. Um, <laughs> Jim Bearden is Emeritus Professor of Sociology at SUNY Geneseo. Uh, Mrs. Cerevalo is Professor of Sociology at RIT. And Jeff Kazanski is Staff Attorney for the Legal Assistance of Western New York. Uh, each of them will have 15 minutes to make his presentation. Then there will be 15 minutes after each of those presentations for members of our panel of inquiry to question them presented for purposes of clarification. So let me introduce the three panelists. Uh, starting on my left, Linda Donahue, Director of Online Labor Studies, Cornell ILR. Uh, Barbara DeLeo, former New York Civil Liberties Union, Genesee Valley Chapter Director. And Bruce Popper, Executive Vice President of the Rochester Labor Council and also Vice President of Healthcare Workers SEIU, Local 1199. So, uh, following the presentations, uh, panel questions, and presenter responses, there will be a question and answer period for you. Uh, and if you have a question you would like to put to a presenter, Please write it down on one of the three by five cards you received when you came in, or if you didn't receive it, we can get it to you. Uh, please limit yourself to a brief question addressed to the panelists you would like to respond. Uh, we'll collect them, and Bill and I will select as many of your questions as there is time to address. Uh, the session is being recorded by Ted Forsyth. Uh, of Indy Media. Uh, at some point, edited versions of the sessions will be posted at our la uh, rochesterlabor.org website. And the written presentations and other materials, including hopefully uh, responses to unanswered questions uh, from you, will be posted there. Uh, a couple of housekeeping issues. Uh, Restrooms are out that door there, but you can't come back through that door. You have to go around and come into the lobby. Uh, food and beverages may be consumed in this room, uh, so you don't have to patronize Tim Horton. Uh, if you're coming on Saturday, you can either brown bag uh, or patronize Tim Horton. Or to eat. Um, there's an attendance sheet that you might have signed on the way in. We'll pass it around, and, and if you didn't sign it before, you can sign it when it comes around. And finally, we urge you to come to the second session uh, Saturday morning, uh, low-wage work and narratives, and the third session Saturday uh, at 1, 
uh, strategies to lift low-wage workers out of poverty. So, we're just about on time. So, Jim, are you ready? I am. Right, come up here and speak to us. Okay. Can you hear me? Do I need to get this to my mic? I am, but I want to get it the right distance so I can also read what I'm going to say. Okay. Thank you so much for coming. I'm going to, I've been given the task of trying to define what low-wage work is. Uh, and I'm going to read this, but I, and I hope that um, it's not too boring. Sometimes listening to people read things can be rather tedious, so I'll, I'll try to liven it up a little bit once in a while. Millions of workers are paid much less than is needed to provide life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Social safeguards such as Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, SNAP, food stamps, unemployment insurance, etc., were invented, invented to cover a part of the gap between wages received and the cost of being a full participant in our social life. But these social payments are inadequate to meet the need because the wage system and the wage levels are fundamentally unfair. You will hear testimony in these hearings describing just how unfair they are. I want to try to make four main points in defining this. First point I want to make is that workers are caught in a dependent relationship beyond their control as individuals. Secondly, a large percentage of workers are paid inadequately. Thirdly, the social wage is also inadequate and in addition is stigmatized. People feel ashamed sometimes to take these things that are meant to cover the gap. And finally, the range of inadequately paid workers is very large. It's not a small group of teenagers working in fast food restaurants. It's a large group of people. First main point then, that Wage workers are free, dependent labor. Historically, freedom is a relatively new phenomenon. For much of human history, workers were tied to particular locations and types of work. Peasants, serfs, slaves, indentured servants, etc., are terms used to describe such unfree labor. Less than 200 years ago, slavery in the United States coincided with wage labor. In the 1830s, Frederick Douglass, while still a slave in Baltimore, earned $1.50 a day in wages, working as a caulker in the shipyards, but all the wages he earned went to his owner. And I'm quoting here from his autobiography. I was now getting, as I have said, $1.50 per day. I contracted for it. I earned it. It was paid to me. It was rightfully my own. Yet, upon returning each Saturday night, I was compelled to deliver every cent of that money to Mr. Hugh. And why? Not because he earned it, not because he had any hand in earning it, not because I owed it to him, nor because he possessed the slightest shadow of a right to it, but solely because he had the power to compel me to give it up. The right of the grim-visaged pirate upon the high seas is exactly the same. Free wage workers working alongside Bal uh, uh, Douglas in Baltimore shipyards, literally working for the same dollar fifty a day, making the same contracts and scraping by. But they got to keep their work, I mean their wages, they didn't have to give it to anybody else, they had to spend it. But they were doubly free. They weren't free just from being slaves, but they were doubly free in Marx's sense because they didn't own any means to produce their living other than by working. Right? They had only their labor power to sell. They were free to choose to work or not to work at a particular job, but they were not free to not work at all. They had to work somewhere. Workers are forced, therefore, to work somewhere, and therefore they are dependent on the kinds of jobs that are available and the social relations that determine the way that work is done at any particular time. That's true today as it was 200 years ago. 
And today, workers are increasingly forced out of regular payroll employment by major companies, Kodak, let's say. And they're turned into freelancers, contract workers, the employees of outsourcing firms where they're tightly controlled about what they do and how they do it, and their wages are cut, their benefits are cut, and we have an increasing uh, debasement of work, as one recent writer <laughs> Now wages, a lot, of, you know, we've had free dependent labor, now wages, what are the bounce of labor? The hard fought victories won by organized workers under, are, it, have been under continuous attack in recent years. The minimum wage was set first in 1938 by the Fair Labor Standards Act, and it was set at 25 cents per day. Oh, sorry, per hour. 25 cents per hour. Douglas is working for $1.50 a day, 25 cents per hour. It's not a huge amount of wage increase from 1830 to uh, 1930. Right. In 1968, the high watermark for the minimum wage was $1.60 in 1968 dollars. That would be worth $11 today if just kept up with inflation. In the 1950s and 1960s, the minimum wage was set at roughly 50% of the average hourly wage of production workers in manufacturing. The percentage dropped to about 40% range in the 80s, and in the 30% range in the 90s, so somewhere in the 30s now. The New York State minimum wage of $8 right now is about 33% of the average hourly earnings of a production worker. On December the 31st, when the min minimum wage in New York rises to $9 per hour, that percentage, is, that percentage will be 37%. So what was once 50% in the 50s is 37% in the 2010s. At $8 an hour, a worker who works 40 hours a week would have $320 a week before taxes, and if they are paid for 52 weeks, unlikely, they would have an annual income of $16,640 before taxes. The official 2014 poverty threshold for one individual living alone is $11,670, and for three individuals, it's $19,000. 790. Minimum wage in New York put most workers at or below the poverty line. And since the official poverty thresholds are based on a formula that was created on expenditures in 1963, we have every reason to question the validity of those thresholds. Now, the wage has been inadequate and we have had these possibilities of increasing what's I've called the social wage. Through organizing and engaging in political structures, work structure, struggle, workers have been able to change some of the conditions of their labor and life chances. Over the past century, capitalist societies were forced to shorten the workday, introduce some safety standards, limit child labor, set the minimum wage, provide health insurance to some, unemployment insurance to some, food stamps to some, and so forth. The U.S. provides a minimal social safety net that is stigmatized and almost always less than working for a living wage. And I've cited here a very famous book by Francis Pox Piven and Richard Cloud, Regulating the Poor, the Functions of Public Welfare, which traces the way welfare is key to the labor market. And if you listen to the television on Tuesday night after the election, you would hear Republican uh, candidates flush with their victory talking about, you know, people have to deserve, they have to work for their thing. They, they, these ideas are deeply involved here, and that's why I say it's stigmatized. To take these things is sometimes seen as a failure, right? Thousands of households in Monroe County, I've got a table, which if you, when we get, we publish this, you'll see the table, which shows that, for instance, um, um, 37,000 plus or minus 1,200 citizens of Monroe County, households in Monroe County, households in Monroe County, it's more people, are, uh, get food stamps, right? Uh, 15,000, almost 16,000 households get SSI, Supplemental Security Income. 
and 12,000 households or more get cash public assistance. All right, now the next point I want to make is about what constitutes a low wage, and this is hard. Right? So I'm going to talk about some of the academic studies of what constitutes a low wage, and I'm going to use two, the two fundamental ways that it's defined. One is the absolute measure of low wages. In a capitalist society, the poor are judged by their presumed moral standing as deserving or undeserving. Right? The deserving poor are those who worked but had an inadequate income, or if they were physically unable to work. They were deserving, and so giving them help is okay. All others, right, if you don't work, you're undeserving. Right? And I, I borrowed this distinction from Thomas Mayhew's study of the London um, labor and London poor in the 1850s. Right? It's been with us a long time. An absolute measure of, of this um, of low wage is based on some notion of cost of living. How much does food, clothing, shelter, and so on cost? Anyone who's close to the minimum cost of living is undoubtedly a low wage worker. Therefore, a worker who is not self-employed, who earned any wage or salary income during the year, and who earns income near or below the official poverty threshold is clearly a low wage worker because her income is inadequate to cover the basic cost of living. There's a website at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in which they try to calculate a cost of living based on the county that a person lives in, and they use more recent surveys about what it actually costs to live in certain places. And if you go to that website, you will find that in Monroe County, they estimate um, the necessary wage to be $20.55 per hour. Right? To be, to have a decent standard of living in Monroe County. So those are absolute measures. There's need and there's some measure of how people compare to that need. Then there are relative measures. How do you fit on the scale right, compared to other workers? And these are academic definitions. I mean, there's a lot of research about low-wage work, and they always have to define what they mean. And here are a couple of the common ones. Uh, defines a category of low-wage work as someone who is not self-employed, who earned any wage or salary income during the year, and who earns less than 50% of the median wage for a full-time year-round worker. Currently, that would be roughly 20 thousand five hundred dollars and that's if they worked 52 weeks 40 years, uh, 52 weeks 40 hours a week that would be nine dollars and 88 cents an hour right using that sort of measure. some researchers bump it up a little bit and say two-thirds of the median right which bumps it up to twenty seven thousand five hundred dollars or putting it in our terms thirteen dollars and twenty two cents an hour Statistical estimates of wage levels and percentiles, you know, if you're the 90th percentile, the 50th percentile, the 20th, etc. right? Um, in 2013, the 30th percentile, right, 30% of wage workers earned less than this was $11.94. So that's another way to think it. The bottom 30% of the income distribution would be a low wage worker. Now, I can't give a specific um, hourly, weekly, or annual wage that I'm going to call low wage. It's pretty clear that it's a broad wage. There are different levels of low wage. It goes all the way, you know, from $8 an hour to $20 an hour. It depends partly on your circumstances, right? And it can be from $10,000 to $40,000. So you can see how this low wage category is a large group. It's going to be 30. 40% of the population, depending on how you look at it. And my last point is that low wage work is not just a few special cases that are temporary in a person's life. Right? Um, there are low wage careers. It is often claimed that low wage jobs are temporary positions that people move through as they progress up the career ladder. In fact, for many workers, there is a kind of low wage career. Here's an example, quoting from a woman in Milwaukee. 
My very first job, I was 16 and I worked for Burger King. I can sing the Burger King song. That's what got me hired. After that, it was school bus, modeling, factory. Not counting factory, I'd say I had about 25 different jobs over the years. That's Ebony Walker. Between many of Ebony's jobs were episodes on welfare occasioned by illness, injury, and childbirth. The kinds of jobs in which she worked did not provide workers' compensation, maternity leave, or even sick leave. And welfare was the lifeline that allowed her to feed herself and her family as she recovered and re regrouped. For women like Ebony, it was a source of support, while punitive and insufficient allowed them to deal with the inadequacies of jobs in the low-wage labor market and the absence of other less stigmatized forms of assistance. Finally, the low-wage occupations. We often think of these low-wage workers as fast food. Well, I put in a table here that identifies some of the occupational areas in, this is from the MIT website of Living Wage, in Monroe County. So healthcare support, $13.17, 17 cents is what they have. Food preparation and serving related, $9.61. These are typicals. Building and ground cleaning maintenance, $13.32. Personal care and services, $10.99. Sales and related, $13.38. Office and administrative support, $16.37. Farming, fishing, forestry, $13.36, production, $14.83, transportation and material moving, $15.53. Right. Most of these occupations are subject to wage pressure from automation and management practices that speed up or intensify the work, but they generally cannot be outsourced overseas. Perhaps many of us in this room are inadequately paid. If you look about, on your daily round. People who are paid less than they are worth and less than they deserve are everywhere. Thank you. discover any variations according to gender or race or is the information that uh, you uncovered pretty generic? No. You know the answer to that, don't you, Linda? <laughs> yes. For the record. For the record. I didn't include it here. You're right. 15 minutes. I can't cover all these things. But you are absolutely correct. If you start breaking this down by gender, race, ethnicity, you get a age you get big differences here and they're they're really shocking differences too often i'm sorry uh, i'm barb deleo and i have a question about the kinds of work historically since your focus was sort of historical how the evolution of low-wage workers now we think of the health care we think of educational institutions but i would be interested in what your research show in terms of looking back in time the kinds of categories of work that were considered low wage Ooh. Well, I didn't look back in time too much, and Vince is going to talk about um, the range of, you know, more detail than, than I have done, but here's what I would say. You know, you, you think about um, uh, uh, Frederick Douglass working in the shipyard, and if you read his autobiography, you know that his owner really didn't employ him at all. He simply hired him out to other people, and the, the famous story when he was sent to a owner who was a, a, a slave breaker, right? And he was 16 years old. And eventually, after being horribly abused, right, then he, he fought back. And his owner then kind of let him be. You know, he was almost, almost a self-agent, except that he was owned and had to give the money there. Well, next to him were working all kinds of people. I, I got, you know, um, some information about Baltimore in a recent book, and I can't remember the title of it, and I didn't put it here, but it's called Scraping By. 
and it talks about the confluence of low-wage work. So at the bottom then, in the 1830s, transportation was mainly by horse, carriage, omnibus, etc., and there was a lot of material on the streets that needed to be scraped up and carried away. And those scrapers were among the low-wage workers, you know. So anybody working historically in dirty, unpleasant, un you know, hot, all those kinds of jobs were the, were the, were the low-wage workers. Right. I, I guess what I was asking, though, I was thinking more in terms of probably the early 1900s and, and the percentage of people that were, and the kinds of jobs, like seamstresses, seamstresses sewing industry, and so on and so forth, those kinds of jobs, too. So you had you have the dirty, the sanitation kinds of things in the late 1800s. Yeah. And then in the early 1900s? Well, in the early 1900s, you bring up a case. You know, I, I quoted statistics from the, you know, the sociological studies of low wage, and they always define it as someone who's not self-employed. Right, but we have people who are not, who are self-employed now right. who are low wage workers. And, and that is, in fact, one of the things that's happening is they're changing work. Um, I was reading just today about FedEx employees who are not employees of FedEx, but are independent contractors, contractors right. right? And, you know, that's sort of parallel in a rough way to the seamstress or someone working in a sweatshop in their house on the Lower East Side of New York or where, you know, so that the, the before the major victories of labor in the 20th century, that time period you're talking about there, Lots of people were low wage workers, you know, and remember there was a revolution, so to speak, among business owners when Henry Ford decided to pay his workers five dollars a day to make cars, but he was clever in the sense that he knew that if his workers couldn't buy the cars, that he had a limited market. It was the beginning of consumerism, not um, being kind to workers. Um, uh, okay. Uh, I, I think I thought the Frederick Douglass point was very profound because it also shows that there was a way to stop the shipyard workers, the, the non-slaves from striking, because if half the workforce was slave and the other half were allegedly free, right? There's a whole dimension here about how these. Uh, I mean, at that point in time, the, the slave owners of the Deep South were the wealthiest class in the world. A second. Uh, first above the imperialist of London. Um, so I, I thought that was, a, I, I had never understood that until I read your paper or heard your remarks. Um, I guess I'll throw a political question back your way. So um, this week we had an election uh, that uh, in many states that elected conservative Republicans as senators and governors, uh, every one of them that had minimum wage on the ballot decisively approved increases in the minimum wage. How do you reconcile that, you know, that apparent schizophrenic position between major popular support for bringing up the minimum wage and electing the very people opposed to it? Well, I'm not going to give a definitive answer here, but I will, I will draw on the, um, you know, the people I know from when I grew up in Texas and their attitudes that are grounded at least in part in racism and based in part on um, kinds of religious beliefs so that there are people across this country who vote Republican but who are, who are actually quite populist in certain ways and they have to work, you know? They work, this is not a trivial, percent. we're talking about millions of people and a lot of them are voting Republican and they're being shafted just like um, people who vote for other parties. So, I, you know, I do not know. It, it, is, it, it is ideological, right? It, it is people, you know, it's, it is a cliche to say that people are not voting in their own interest, and, and I do not know how to challenge that, but um, I do know that the role of the mass media and the lack of any control on corporate financing of elections and being able to advertise and people who watch Fox News don't know their own interest by any means. 
Uh, just one follow-up point to the, and I agree with Bruce, this very compelling quote you have here on Frederick Douglass, but I just want to point <laughs> out that while slaves were handing their paychecks over to their owners, women were compelled to hand their paychecks over to their husbands. In many cases, the paycheck was actually made payable to the husband for the wife's work. Um, so just an interesting little historical note there. Um, so anyway, we, 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 need to, we need to move along, but thank you very much, Jim, for very interesting information. Thank you. Okay, to remind people the way this is working, uh, Q and in between you guys and both guys happens after all three presentations. But for it to happen, you need to put your questions down on a three by five card, which I see Jim reaching for. So Jim, you're gonna hand up three by five card? Yeah. What a guy. So as you listen or reflecting back on what you've heard, yeah, you can formulate a question uh, we'll try to get to it later. Vincent. Low wage work is not new to Rochester, New York, or the nation. Even during times of economic growth and prosperity, teachers' aid, cashier, home health care aid, wait staff, housekeeper, janitor were low pay occupations that served the needs of the area's better off workers. They have always been essential, yet devalued lines of work. What has been new for the past three decades for both Rochester and the nation, however, is the growth of, is the growth of low wage service sector occupations and the decline of processing sector jobs, especially manufacturing and related occupations that provide high pay and good benefits but require little or no post-secondary education. For Rochester, and by the way, all the data that I'm going to present uh, I'll use the word Rochester, but it's the Rochester statistical area, which includes the six counties, uh, uh, Monroe and Ontario, Yates, Wayne, Livingston, Orlean. For Rochester, one half of its good paying manufacturing jobs were lost over the past 15 years. The decline of Kodak and two others of the former big three is obviously a major reason for this, as any Rochesterian knows. But many smaller production firms, like Delphi, uh, General Railway Signal, and Schlegel, also reduced their workforce and sometimes lowered the wages of those they kept. By the early 21st century, business and political leaders were optimistic that a new economy would emerge based on cleaner, knowledge-based work in the fields of high technology and healthcare. And the University of Rochester was the model. It became the region's largest employer in 2005. And it would act as a new economic growth engine by partnering with business to create business incubators, technology startups, patents, and medical breakthroughs in its labs. In short, it was the example of the eds and meds to which many post-industrial Northeast cities um, turned to escape economic decline. Uh, one, here's what one business group uh, said about this hope in our eds and meds. They said, in many respects, the bell towers of academic institutions have replaced the smokestacks as the drivers of the American urban economy. As America transitions to a knowledge-based economy, <clears throat> institutions of higher education have become engines of economic growth. Well, in fact, Rochester's top 10 establishments ranked by size of workforce, five are universities, hospitals, and health insurance uh, providers. The area's two largest universities have explicitly included the role of economic growth engine and have used that exact phrase in their long-term plans. And like the nation as a whole, Rochester did find an increase in so-called good service work often connected with higher education and medical fields, like financial services, engineering, computers, and healthcare. Now these occupations gain most of the attention of business observers, 
But the full story is the large growth of low paying or bad service jobs. For in line with the nation, what Rochester has experienced since the 1990s is an employment polarization, whereby secure good paying jobs that help create uh, the middle class have contracted and are being replaced by service work of low quality jobs at one end and service work of high quality jobs at the other. By 2010, for example, of the approximately 30 startup companies nurtured by our universities that demand highly educated professional and technical skill, most, most of these startups employ five or fewer employees. On the other hand, jobs in the field of educational services, healthcare support, personal care and hospitality are expanding. Contingent work. Uh, constitutes a significant portion of jobs in these fields, such as adjunct professors in Rochester's largest employer, and part-time cashiers in the second largest employer, which is Wegmans. Uh, last summer, a Wegmans uh, spokesperson said that 56% of its workers are part-time. Low-wage work, as defined by the National Employment Law Project, as between $7.69 an hour and $13.83 an hour, that constituted about 59% of Rochester's job growth between 2010 and 2012. The most recent data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics show that three out of 10 Rochester workers are in low-wage occupations earning less than $29,000 annually. So that's about 30%. Uh, making lower, uh, less than $29,000 a year. In his 10-year forecast for the top 30 occupations with the most job growth for a 10-year period between 2012 and 2022, the Bureau of Labor Statistics forecast that 13 of these, or 43%, will pay below the wage uh, will pay the low wage annual salary of $28,766. A majority, 17 of these 30 occupations, pay below the national median salary of $34,750. Uh, while it currently promotes itself as an innovation center, which you might have heard this morning uh, on the local radio stations, uh, Rochester's occupational structure is consistent with the national outlook. If you look at the top 10 uh, occupations that will have the most growth over the next, uh, up until 2022, six of these 10 pay low wages, uh, as defined uh, as less than $13.83 an hour. And only one pays above the national median salary. I'm gonna look at these top, uh, I'm gonna look at the, these six and uh, the number one on the list of the top growing occupations over the next 10 years is personal care aides. In Rochester, personal care aides, uh, with 17,000 workers in the Rochester area, this is one of Rochester's largest occupations. <coughs> the overall median hourly wage for this category is $10.53. Well over half of uh, jobs in this category are personal care and child care aides and hairstylists and these jobs pay between $9 and $11 an hour. Retail sales is the third uh, highest growing occupation projected over the next 10 years. There are over 47,000 of these workers in Rochester. And it comprises the, uh, among the largest jobs in our area. Uh, yet the median hourly wage is $11.40. Nearly seven out of 10 jobs in this occupation are retail salespeople and cashiers that pay between nine and ten dollars an hour. Home health aides, fourth largest growing occupation. There are over four thousand in Rochester. And this is an occupation that will grow as the country's baby boomers age. It has a median hourly wage of twelve dollars and fifty nine cents. Workers in this field give personal attention to the infirmed, such as bathing, feeding, cooking, and light housekeeping. 
Uh, another occupation among the top 10 is combined food preparation. This includes fast food, and it totals 42,000 workers in Rochester. The overall uh, median hourly wage is the lowest. It's uh, $9.01 an hour. <clears throat> fast food workers are in this category, but so are wait staff and restaurant cooks, which together account for 70% of the jobs in this category. And they make between $9 and $11 an hour. A fifth category, nursing assistants. With 6,100 nursing assistants, uh, they, along with home health aides, dominate the health care support category in Rochester. And the median hourly wage is $12.60, while high-paying health care practitioner occupations like physicians, nurses, physical therapists, and medical technologists are growing. Workers in, this, in these fields, you know, these high-paid, high-prestigious jobs, depend on the much lower paying jobs like nursing assistants and home health aides. There are about four times as many nursing assistants than there are physicians in Rochester. And there are nearly the same number of low-wage home health aides and nursing assistants as there are architects and engineers in Rochester. Finally, janitors. This is in the, is in the category of building and grounds and maintenance occupations. Again, among the top 10 growing occupations over the next 10 years. Janitors make up 90% of the 15,000 jobs in this category. Their median hourly wage is $11.08. Many of these janitors, plus groundkeepers and cleaners, work at our local colleges and universities. Well, officers in these schools, like provosts, senior vice presidents, and financial officers, and some professors, they can earn up to $250 an hour. The presidents of these uh, schools can make over $400 an hour. Another way to understand the signif significant role that low-wage service work plays in Rochester is to examine what its business community calls the top 100 list of local private companies. Uh, to be on this list, you have to have generated at least a million dollars in revenue in the past three years. And if you look at this list of 100 top firms, retail and service dominate. Service, retail sales, hotel sales combined total 43 of the 100 firms. And many of the technology firms involve mostly service occupations or don't make any products. For example, the number one company for 2014, UTC, its ultimate technology company, is listed as a technology company while it serves retail companies through hardware and software, it provides business services, and it no longer manufactures anything in Rochester. The third top company, Conserve, does debt collection. And while Eds and Meds are hailed by some as the path to Rochester's economic revitalization, we have to acknowledge the low-wage jobs required by them. Full-time tenured and tenure-track college professors now make up only about 27% of the nation's professors. Temporary or long-term part-time instructors now dominate. And adjunct professors make about $3,500 per 16-week long course. Rochester's largest two universities, the U of R and RIT, rely less on part-time instructors compared to the nation but between 30 to 35 percent of their courses during any given semester are taught by grad graduate students and adjuncts. And they receive little, if any, medical benefits. So there are many reasons for the current rise in a polarized labor market, including business deregulation policies, offshoring, global economic trade and competition. Uh, well, we are led to believe that these big transformations occur by some natural, impersonal forces, but they are, they are formed, in fact, through private decision-making by business owners and boards of directors, often done for short-term gain. This is far beyond the direct control of individual workers and certainly cannot be attributed to a poor work ethic or lack of drive on the part of Rochester's workers. Low-wage workers bear the majority of risks of making a, a living in the so-called new economy. Now, a, a related question to this is, why do the jobs pay so low? 
why, is there, why do these jobs have low wages? And uh, this is a, a long-standing debate in social science where uh, one side argues that society has important jobs, important as defined by what's important for society's survival. And therefore, those jobs should be paid more because we have to give incentive to people to go for those jobs that are important for society's survival. Critics argue uh, two things. Uh, number one is, is that if you look at some of the highest paid jobs in our society, uh, executive officers of uh, alcohol companies, tobacco companies, and gambling, they are bringing in tens of millions of dollars a year. And it's very, very hard to argue that those positions are important for society's survival. And uh, secondly, if you, if you look at the top positions in our EDs and NEDs, in our post-secondary institutions and in the healthcare industry, uh, those people in those positions have a great deal of power to manipulate and to keep their wages high. For example, by uh, limiting the number of students that they admit into their programs. The current faith in innovation by Rochester's political and business leaders doesn't offer much hope for the area's low-wage workers. And worker retraining programs seem unable to keep up with an economy based on rapid change. And the same political and economic policies behind the employment pulverization have also made it very difficult for workers to form unions and negotiate strong contracts that help create a good, the good living, st living standards in the post-World War II era. The structural changes we see nationwide and in Rochester may be better addressed by universal changes, such as a mandated living wage for all workers. Addressing the full impact of low-wage work and life would require that we decouple wages from standards of living. So beyond a basic living wage, this would include, in free or subsidized form, such necessities as mass transportation, health care, child care, college or vocational education for workers, regardless of their wages. operations of our free enterprise system, the more successful it is, the more likely we are to have <laughs> low-wage work. I mean, the reason for uh, business success has to do with finding the lowest cost in production. And um, the general political and economic change since the, the mid-1970s, I think, helps explain this. On the, on the, in the political side, there is the move towards uh, what is known as neoliberalism, which means uh, to put more and more faith in markets as opposed to any kind of government uh, intervention or government regulation. So the deregulation of business, for example, and, and, and non-interfering with the market. Uh, on top of that, also taking place in the mid-1970s was a very, very a well-organized campaign against unions. Um, uh, many uh, so-called labor relation consultant firms emerged at this time who have come up uh, 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 with very, very uh, clever uh, and very, very effective ways of stopping workers from forming unions when they try at the workplace and even when they come into work by, by giving them orientations in which unions are, are uh, discouraged, strongly discouraged. Uh, so, uh, and uh, the economic side, of course, is uh, the competition from the uh, much more global economic system now. Uh, with communication technology and trans uh, transportation technology, it's much, much easier, much, much faster to be able to quickly move your business operations to other parts of the country where uh, wages are lower and, and there are open shop right to work states, uh, or in other parts of the world where there's far even far less business regulation. Uh, so a combination of, of political and economic changes that, that's been uh, 
in operation since the mid-1970s. Vince, thank you so much for a very interesting paper. I would like you, please, though, if you will, to flesh out the, the last little bit of your paper where you said addressing the full impact of low-wage work and life would require that we decouple wages from the uh, standard of living, standards of living. Could you talk a little more about that? And then you go on to say beyond basic living wages, this would include free and subsidized form, such necessities as mass transportation, health care, child care, education, regardless of your wages. Oh yeah, I think I, I, I suspect that on Saturday morning when we hear testimony from many of our low-wage workers that uh, you'll hear them talk about the problems of things like getting childcare, transportation, uh, ownership of a car, for example, is very, very expensive. So uh, if, if wages uh, don't increase, well, then if we provide uh, free public transportation or very, very low, uh, cheap <laughs> mass public transportation, free or subsidized childcare, then many of these needs can be met. It, it, that's that notion of the social wage that Jim spoke about earlier. Is it your insinuation then that if those things were provided, that it would reduce low-wage workers? I mean, as opposed to increasing their salaries, that's what I'm struggling with here, is, is providing childcare. I mean, I understand the need for all those things, but it doesn't eliminate the need to make more money. Well, so it, it certainly is, it, yes, I mean, well, I mean, if I were making $13 an hour, it would be tough. It would be much easier at $13 an hour if I didn't have to pay for gasoline for my car, uh, uh, payment for daycare, um, uh, okay. child care services. Uh, However, our provost who's making $400,000 a year also has the advantage well, of being able right. to use free transportation and the, the home health aides and, and other low-wage workers aren't any better off, they just are struggling less. That's a good way of putting it, they're struggling less. Uh, number one, they could attain a, a, a standard of living uh, that, that we could, be, that we could consider, consider to be appropriate for a nation uh, like ours. But secondly, you are talking exactly about the previous point I made about the idea that there has to be income inequality because of, some people believe that certain positions are more important than others. So uh, inequality may, may not be perfectly addressed by this, but, it, but, but that kind of social wage is, is something that, that um, given what we see happening uh, in terms of the, uh, the uh, decline of strong union contracts, the decline of good paying manufacturing jobs, I mean, this is one of the things. So you're not suggesting this as an either or, you're suggesting this as an and. Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> Thank you. I'm trying to think of how to how to formulate my question exactly, but um, I mean historically, during the times of slavery, the plantation owners insisted that the world would collapse if we eliminated free labor, and the early industrialists insisted that the world would collapse if they had to pay the seamstresses and the tailors uh, and the miners more money than they were paying. And yet, they unionized and the world didn't collapse, lo and behold. Um, the same has been true with the minimum wage. Time and time again, we're told the world will collapse if we raise the minimum wage, and mysteriously it doesn't. Um, so what do you think and I know this is just a speculatory question, but what do you think is going to be the tipping point here for raising of service workers in the kinds of industries that you've described up and out of uh, poverty? Because most of them, from the information we've heard here this evening, um, are living ex exactly in poverty. Will there be a point at which that, too, gets changed? Well, I, I think that came up in... Uh in the, in the very last question, when when Jim was presenting, and has you know why why do we see these politicians being voted into office who don't represent the interests uh, of, of most of the population of the country? Uh, and part of it uh, has to do with the fact that it's very 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 easy not to be very much involved with politics, and it's very easy not to know very much about what political uh, official candidates stand for. It's very very hard at low wage work. 
how can you keep up with the news? What, you, you really lack the resources to become an engaged and informed citizen. And, and, and it's very, very easy to be a bad citizen and either not vote or um, vote in ways that are objectively not in your, in your interest. Um, so, but another, you know, you asked what would be the tipping point. Again, I refer to Jim's presentation. He mentioned the book by uh, Piven and Cloward called The Regulation of the Poor. And there the argument in that book is very, very clear. The tipping point happens when, when the people begin to engage in civil unrest. Uh, no, no civil unrest, no complaints, no demonstrations, no demonstrations, no marches, and no attention. I have one more question. Um, would you speak just a little bit to the evolution of the lower wage entrepreneur, not business owner, but the home health aide who no longer works for an agency, but is now an independent contractor and is employed, as many domestic workers are, housekeepers, um, there seems to be a change in the market for that. That seems to be increasing in my perception. I don't know whether that's accurate. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, I'm afraid I, I don't know about that. I, I, my own personal experience with home health care aides is that, uh, thank God for home health care aides, because my mother depends on uh, two of them who come in every day and provide essential services. Uh, they work with an agency. Uh, and they, they are, uh, one is on Medicaid, and they, they, they really cannot survive on the wages that they're getting. But um, unfortunately, I don't know about the independent contractors in that field. Right, many of those people do move out from underneath the agencies because they're charging you $30 an hour and getting paid 9 or $10 an hour. And, but what happens is then they lose what minimal benefits or regular work. And so I just wondered if you had any comment about that. Only in general, that you know, these so-called free agents, it's, it's, it's a very, very risky thing because of the inability for things Absolutely. like medical insurance and... I don't think it's a choice. I think when they see what people are being charged and what they're being paid, they're trying. Right. It's not a good thing. Right. Thank you. I guess just one last point. I'm looking um, Vincent. Um, your paper, it seems to me that um, home health aides, teachers aides, groundskeepers, retail sales, food preparation, et cetera, the categories that you've talked about, do have <coughs> one thing in common? <coughs> they have one thing in common? <coughs> it's that it's work that can't be moved out of town. I mean, there are some technologies now in medicine that are telemedicine, et cetera, but, but almost all of the categories of growth are the remaining jobs that have to be done in person in this location. As are the most of the eds and meds. Universities okay. uh, don't pick up and leave as easily as do corporations and hospitals as well. <laughs> I'm not one of the questioners, but uh, it strikes me that it strikes me that in addition to deregulation and privatization, the other thing that the uh, the one percent want is lower taxes. And the reason I'm raising that is because implicit in your point about the social wage, meaning low cost transportation, health care. Um, education, etc. it doesn't do a low wage, work, low wage worker any good to have those things if he's the one or she's the one paying the taxes. So I suspect that your, your point implies raising taxes on the 1%. Can you agree with that or disagree with it or elaborate? On it? Well, well, I think you have to make a distinction between um, some of the some of the uh, solutions that would help versus some of the solutions that are not politically likely <laughs> in this day and age. Uh, so I think yes, it would largely depend on uh, a much more progressive tax structure. And uh, is that likely to happen very soon? I don't think so. Thank you, Ben.
before Jeff starts, two things. One, uh, Jim has some white. Did you have? Oh, you uh, you're collecting any them? If anybody has like filled like out a card a question with a question, uh, you can give it to Jim or pass it to him. And I've also been asked to announce that to exit the building, uh, you need to go out the South Avenue entrance. I guess they're closed back here. Yeah. Good afternoon. Hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Jeff Nazanski. I'm an attorney with Legal Assistance of Western New York. I'm here today to present my findings on forms of low wage worker exploitation in our community and in anticipation of Saturday's testimony from workers and proposed solutions to the serious problem. Not meant to be all inclusive of every type of uh, exploitation. Um, but I want to hit, hit the, uh, the main points, uh, first one being wage theft. The 40-hour work week, as uh, was mentioned earlier, became law with the passage of the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938, over 75 years ago. Yet lack of compliance with this law remains a bitter reality right here in the community of Monroe, giving unscrupulous employers an unfair competitive edge over their competitors and leaving taxpayers to support underpaid workers with public benefits. In 2010, Governor Patterson signed into law some of the nation's strongest protections against wage theft, the New York State Wage Theft Pre uh, Prevention Act. Um, and I understand Linda Donahue was involved in some of the research that went into that as far as uh, that goes, and there's a report on uh, the cost of worker misclassification in the back of the room if you didn't get it on your way in. And there's also a handout on the worker, uh, on, on the Wage Theft Prevention Act that you might want to pick up if you haven't seen it. Um, the law uh, quadrupled the penalties for employers who steal workers' pay and enhanced whistleblower protection from retaliation. Despite the Wage Theft Protection Act, wage theft is still a real problem. In July, Governor Cuomo announced that during the first six months of, of 2014, investigators recovered and dispersed more than $16 million in wages, interest, and damages to over 21,000 workers cheated out of their proper pay and benefits, and that the state was on track to recover more stolen wages than ever in its history. While the governor cites these recoveries as evidence of improved enforcement, his critics see these recoveries as merely the tip of, an ice, of the iceberg. Wage theft is, is the most pervasive form of low wage worker exploitation. Wage theft occurs when workers do not receive wages that they have a right to, when an employer takes money that belongs to, an, to employees and keeps it. Common forms of wage theft are unpaid overtime, and paying less than the minimum wage, not giving workers their last paycheck after they leave a job, and not paying for all the hours worked, not paying vacation and holiday pay that an employer agreed to, and not paying wages at all. Several forms of wage theft can be seen in the following story. In March 2012, an upscale Manhattan restaurant reached a settlement with the New York State Attorney General Eric Schneiderman over its illegal theft of wages from 25 employees. The restaurant did not pay for overtime, paid less than a minimum wage, and withheld tips. Two immigrant busboys were paid no wages at all and were subsisting solely on tips. After he was sued, the restaurant owner demanded the busboys' working papers, then retaliated by reducing their hours and then firing them. The Attorney General reached a settlement that required the restaurant to pay restitution of $25,000 to each of the two busboys and $150,000 to 23 other workers. In announcing the $200,000 settlement of retaliation claims against employees and other illegal labor practices by the Attorney General, uh, the Attorney General proclaimed that by scaring employees into silence, employer retaliation undermines basic labor law protections. Wage theft includes misclassification of employees as independent contractors. According to the New York Department of Labor, 
Employee misclassification occurs when a worker is improperly denied the benefits and protections provided to employees, as that term is defined by state and federal law. Workers who are classified as employees receive a wide range of legal protections, including eligibility for unemployment insurance if they're laid off, eligibility for workers' compensation if they're injured on the job, and where applicable, the right to be paid the minimum wage and overtime pay. On February 1st, 2014, the New York State Department of Labor's annual report on the Joint Enforcement Task Force on Employee Misclassification included a recent study based on audits of New York employment records. It found that up to 10% of the employees appear to have been misclassified. Misclassifying just 1% of workers as independent contracts, contractors costs the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund $198 million annually. And that's 95% of workers who claimed that they were misclassified as independent contractors were reclassified as employees following review. This has created a problem with the New York State uh, Trust Fund in that uh, the state has had to borrow from the federal government in order to pay benefits under the workers, under the unemployment insurance law. Still, another form of wage theft involves employees who are paid off the books and are not reported at all for tax and other financial purposes. This form of exploitation robs the worker of many protections, including workers' compensation, disability, Social Security, and unemployment compensation. Taxes that are not paid by such workers and employers adds to the overall tax burden the rest of us share. Wage theft is not restricted to unskilled workers, Workers paid by a contractor or subcontractor of a, of a federal government contract are entitled to receive what is known as a prevailing wage for that kind of work in the area where the work is done. Prevailing wages are calculated by the U.S. Department of Labor and are higher than the minimum wage. Many federal contractors, however, simply ignore this law. Wage theft is not the only way low-wage workers are exploited. Workers are also exploited when employers fail to provide protections and safeguards required by law. I have personally seen recent cases here in Rochester of employers who have failed to follow the law that requires a wage statement, commonly referred to as a paycheck stub, be given to employees. Another form of worker exploitation is the subminimum wage. Companies in New York can still pay less than the minimum wage, as little as $5 per hour, to restaurant servers, delivery workers, and nearly a quarter million other workers in the food service industry who receive tips. Although employers are legally required to top off a tip worker's pay to bring it up to the minimum wage of $8 an hour now, uh, when it doesn't meet regular minimum wage, enforcement is often ineffective. So uh, there's a big problem in this area and that's why a wage board is being uh, convened um, by the governor with a hearing next week in Buffalo. If people can go to that, um, that would be good. As a result of uh, high poverty, uh, as a result of high poverty, low wages, and unstable paychecks are a common way of life for New York's tipped workers, roughly 70% of whom are women. Governor Cuomo, uh, Cuomo has now called for the wage board study uh, of the state's subminimum wage for tipped workers, and with the stroke of a pen, uh, the Cuomo administration can end this unfair and outdated policy by issuing a wage order requiring employers to to directly pay tip workers the full minimum wage with tips in addition. Scheduling is another way to exploit low-wage part-time workers by preventing them from working sufficient hours to earn a living wage. Many employers of part-time workers do not provide a consistent, regular schedule for employees and instead demand that employees remain flexible to work at times most convenient to their employer. Scheduling is now a powerful tool to bolster profits, allowing businesses to cut labor costs with a few keystrokes. It's like magic, said Charles DeWitt, Vice President for Business Development at Kronos, which supplies the software for Starbucks and many other chains. Virtually every major retailer, retail and restaurant chain rely on software that schedules workers using sales settings, often without regard to workers' needs. Starbucks, according to an August New York Times article, uses such software to determine which of its 130,000 baristas are needed in its thousands of locations and exactly when they'll be needed. Preventing 
low-wage workers from taking better paying jobs is still another way to control and take advantage of low-wage low -wage workers. Non-compete clauses are now appearing in far-ranging fields beyond the worlds of technology, sales, and corporations with tightly held secrets where the curbs have traditionally been used. From event planners to, to chefs to yoga instructors, employees are increasingly required to sign agreements that prevent them from working for a company's rivals. Daniel McKinnon, who had been a hairstylist in Norwell, Massachusetts, lost the court battle with his former employer, who claimed that Mr. McKinnon had violated the terms of his agreement when he went to work in a nearby salon. Mr. McKinnon said that he did not think the original restriction to wait at least 12 months before working at any salon in nearby towns still applied because he had been fired after years of friction with the manager there. Shortly after being fired, he went to work in a nearby salon. But a judge issued an injunction ordering him to stop working at his new employer. It was, and I quote, uh, it was pretty lousy that you would take away someone's livelihood like that, said Mr. McKinnon, who for the following year lived off jobless benefits of $300 a week. I almost lost my truck. I almost lost my apartment. Almost everything came sweeping out from under me, he said. And then there are the employers that find ways around the loss. Walmart again stirred up adverse publicity when it recently changed its dress code for employees. Although federal law requires employers to provide workers with uniforms, Walmart is, in, is instead requiring workers to supply their own clothes to meet its dress code, which is as such not technically a uniform. The problem of wage theft and other forms of worker exploitation are, no, by, uh, are by no means isolated. Right here in, in Rochester and Monroe County, similar types of wage theft and exploit, exploitation occur every day. In my work as an attorney, I have personally seen cases where employers do not pay work, wa wages to workers, instead providing only a room to stay in, in exchange for working as many as 12 hours a day, seven days a week. And the law protecting workers from wage theft is under attack. In June of this year, both the State Assembly and the New York State Senate passed a bill to amend the New York State Wage Theft Protection Act, eliminating the need for employers to provide annual wage notices to their existing employees. Uh, the uh, annual wage notices that are supposed to be handed out by February, uh, February 1st, I believe is what the law calls for, is uh, the, the act says you have to get that notice so you'll know whether or not you're uh, exempt from overtime pay or not. And uh, so that is, has met a, uh, with a lot of employer um, uh, hostility. And that's uh, on the, on the uh, chopping block. But fortunately, the, the bill that's been passed by uh, the legislature also imposes harsher penalties for wage law violations and imposes new liability on repeat offenders. The bill awaits the governor's signature. So stay tuned. Thank you very much. The question is where did the money go, right? I mean, you know, David K. Johnston, which is a local hero and the stuff, shows that there's tons of money being produced, the economy keeps growing, but it doesn't go to the bottom 99 percent. If you add up the money, Robert Wright is probably the best proponent of this, explaining, you know, economic bills to economy. Our argument is that the principal, the principal strategy to address poverty is, low, is, is increasing wages. As that money then gets spent and generates business in poorer communities, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if we don't do that, uh, so does it, does it increase cost? I don't buy any of those arguments. I think that the net, the net increase in jobs in poorer communities and spending in poorer communities, et cetera, et cetera. It was the argument over extending the federal unemployment. You recall that um, increasing or continuing federal unemployment subsidies to the long-term unemployed was considered the best way to dump money immediately into the economy because that money was spent, and it was spent uh, primarily local here, at least in the areas where these workers live. I, I qualify that because Walmart is not a local corporation, but at least it's, it's being spent and it, and it increases the economy and the economic activity.
Mm -hmm. I'm not an expert, John, but I would say absolutely, because I think all it means is that people wouldn't have to work four jobs. They would have more time to take care of their kids, to take care of their community, to do volunteer work, and to make our area a better place to live instead of having to cobble together four jobs and pay somebody to take care of their kids, underpay them, so their kids aren't cared for as perhaps as well as they should. Uh, did you have a thought? Well, I think that history is a good teacher. And it has been proven time and time again that when you increase workers' wages, the economy improves. Thrives. It thrives, exactly. And we don't have to speculate. We know what history has shown us. If you pay workers a better wage, they contribute back to their communities, just as Bruce pointed out. So uh, all I can do is underscore what, what's been said. There was an article in The Nation uh, two or three weeks ago that actually was based on a, uh, a study of all the studies of this question. And the answer is no. Raising the wages uh, doesn't raise, doesn't screw up the economy and make havoc out of life for everybody. I have a response to this as well. I want to think about, this is a wealthy country. And every year we produce this much goods and services. And it's simply a matter of deciding how you split that up. And it's a social choice. None of it is fixed by law or nature or anything. And we have to change the politics of this country so that the balance shifts away from the wealthy and back to labor. Uh, misclassification seemed quite evident that workers are woefully uneducated about what their rights and responsibilities as members of the workforce are. And I'm just wondering to what extent you think that an unfamiliarity with what the term independent contractor is, or a 1099er as they call them, um, do you think that that exacerbates the problem of misclassification? That people simply don't know they're being misclassified because they have no idea what it means? When, in fact, I think some people actually like the notion that they're an independent contractor. Sure. Isn't that so American? Yeah. Yeah, it has that kind of frontier feel right. to it right there. Well, that is, a, I think, a very good point in that um, I think people uh, look at the law and see it to be quite confusing. They don't understand what their rights are and, and uh, don't know where to go to find out what their rights are. They don't have ready access to information about their rights and thus um, whether or not they are supposed to be considered an employee and therefore entitled to have uh, Social Security uh, deductions uh, made and contributions made by the employer so that when they're old and infirm and can't work any longer, they can collect Social Security. Independent contractors don't have that protection. Don't have the unemployment protections, don't have the workers' comp protection. So yes, it's a huge problem, not just in the area of independent contractors, but across the board. Uh, I was astonished to have a client come into my office to say that um, you know she wasn't getting paid for her work. All she got was a room and board. One meal and a room. That was it, working seven days a week, 12 hours a day. I don't believe it. I have a question. Um, actually, I have several questions. Without naming names necessarily, has there been local money recovered for wage theft? I'm, I'm sure there, there has been. Um, and I'm sure that the Attorney General's office is looking into even, even more because I've been involved in in that myself. So, yes. So we should be, people should be, we all should be on the lookout for that. Certainly, um, yes. Good idea. How would an employee who might be in this room or know somebody in this room contact your office about wage theft and learn more about it? Um, well, our office is uh, Legal Assistance of Western New York, 325-2520. And uh, 
call our office and uh, or you can uh, tomorrow we're going to be talking about some solutions yeah. Saturday Saturday not tomorrow Saturday thank you um, <coughs> and so um, you know, we, we do have uh, some ideas for solutions one of, one of which being a worker center designed to help people learn about what they can do in conjunction with other workers to uh, enforce their rights on the job. Do you have flyers from your office you could put on? Are there flyers from your office that can be distributed on Saturday? Uh, yes, I think I can bring some flyers. <coughs> yes. And my last question has to be has to do with your best guess about tipped workers. Where do you think that's going? And will domestic workers ever get included in minimum wage laws? From my understanding, domestic workers were included in uh, what in recent legislation a couple years ago. If I'm not mistaken. Was that? I didn't see that. What's that? Linda? In New York. In New York. In New York State. Yeah. Uh, tip, guess about tip workers. Tip workers are. Uh, yeah, I think that there's, there's been an, uh, one of the downstate uh, uh, worker centers called Make the Road New York. Uh, among other groups in New York City have been very active on this issue, pushing the governor by demonstrating every month in Albany and in New York and and creating the environment to do something about tip workers. So I'm cautiously optimistic. Jeff, you and I are both involved in the formation of a worker center in Rochester. Um, one of the meetings I went to as we were getting more information was with a couple of the successful worker centers in New York City, uh, one of which is the one in Chinatown that had a lot of success some years ago about tip workers and abuses on wage theft in that area. But one of the things they said is that that tactic had become unsuccessful because of the Labor Department, the State Labor Department, having a 17,000 case backlog. Can you address the issue of enforcement and adequacy of the enforcement departments uh, from your perspective as representing workers. And I also know Denise Young is in the room who's with the Public Employee Federation and they've complained vociferously about the cuts in labor department um, uh, uh, positions that enforce these laws. Yeah, good question. I think that uh, part of the, the problem is there's not enough staff at the labor department to um, enforce these these laws that are on the books. And I had one case when I was working down in the southern tier of, of a uh, worker at a, a restaurant who uh, was, I helped him file a wage claim and the, the amount of wages that we calculated he was owed was $17,000. But when the, um, the, the claim was processed by the Department of Labor, they suggested asking for only $2,000. So, and the, say, and the explanation was, well, if we can get that much, we, if we try to get more, it'll just uh, appeal it, and it'll be two years, and, and, and so that's part of the problem is that, you know, the wheels of justice go too slow, and that's why I think the, uh, the concept of a worker center makes so much sense, because that allows people to do more creative type things, like going right to the employer, maybe bring, you know, your local clergy with you, maybe, uh, pick it outside their, their house or their business if necessary to demand that they pay you for what you work. I love the quote that uh, I think John found for this whole um, presentation it was something to the effect that if you don't, you, you steal from your, your boss, you're gonna march you out you know, in, in handcuffs. But uh, if your boss steals from you, good luck trying to collect. When I read that article, I didn't see anything about the, the boss going to jail, unfortunately. I, I, by my way of thinking, I think there should be more um, criminal penalties assessed. There are criminal um, penalties in the law in wage theft cases, but I don't see them used all that much, and I don't know why that is. I think it's uh, the, the district attorneys have to bring criminal charges, and district attorneys, that's a white collar crime, and um, you know, some big cities have white collar crime units, but I don't know to what extent they prosecute those. I have not seen any, uh, if anybody hears anybody uh, of them, I'd, I'd be interested.
other question from the audience is, uh, is there any attempt to unionize med techs? Uh, how about other healthcare workers? I think we probably have someone who can answer that. <laughs> um, well, it depends. What, what do you mean by med techs? That's the first uh, Medical technicians? Yeah. Um, the short answer is yes, and the long answer is no. Uh, the short answer is, you know, we're trying to, you hear my remarks on Saturday, address the fact that we are stuck in a 1935 paradigm called the National Labor Relations Act, which severely draws, if you think reapportionment is a problem in politics, you should see it in labor. The bargaining unit definitions in hospitals, they're incredibly broad and very, very difficult to bring groups together that are considered single voting groups. Um, outside of that, um, you get smaller groups and you end up hitting small groups of workers against big health systems with completely unlimited pockets. So that's why the, the short answer is yes, there are a lot of efforts to bring all healthcare workers in this town, which is a very non-union town for healthcare, unlike Syracuse and Buffalo. Uh, but the longer answer is it's very, very difficult if we still continue to operate within that NLRB uh, private sector uh, labor relations paradigm uh, and our efforts which have been legion over the years are proof of that. Um, other question is will higher wages simply result in higher cost of living uh, the same standard for low wage workers? Anybody want to answer? <laughs> the question is, where did the money go, right? I mean, you know, David K. Johnston, which is a local bureau and this stuff, shows that there's tons of money being produced. The economy keeps growing, but it doesn't go to the bottom 99%. If you add up the money, Robert Wright is probably the best proponent of this, e explaining, you know, economics 101. If you give money to workers, they spend it in the community. And if you don't, right, and that then builds the economy, our argument is that the principal, the principal strategy to address poverty is, low, is, is increasing wages, because that money then gets spent and generates business in poorer communities, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if we don't do that, uh, so does it, does it increase cost? I don't buy any of those arguments. I think that the net, the net increase in jobs in poor communities and spending in poor communities, et cetera, et cetera. It was the argument over extending the federal unemployment, you recall that um, increasing or continuing federal unemployment subsidies to the long-term unemployed was considered the best way to dump money immediately into the economy because that money was spent. And it was spent uh, primarily locally or at least in the areas where these workers lived. I, I qualify that because Walmart is not a local corporation, but at least it's, it's being spent and it, and it increases the economy and the economic activity hamburger place with arches and they were talking about the employees of this particular organization in Europe who were paid above the minimum wage they were paid close to $20 an hour to flip hamburgers and fry french fries and they made record profits the percentage of their profits in Europe is higher than it is than the percentage of profits in the United States with low wages so we need to send the management to Europe to study this. <laughs> um, are there any other three by five cards? Is there anybody who didn't write a comment down on a card who wants to ask a question? I just like that old, I'm an artist. Plus, I go to school for uh, architect. Would you like to come? Could you come up and use a mic? Well, give me the mic. Please. Yeah. We got a mic coming to you. I'm an architect and I believe that, you know, I'm from New York City and my family's from England, you know, Northern England, and I grew up here in the States. But at the same time, I realized that, you know, the economy is not the economy. You know, everybody want a nice car, everybody want to have a pocket full of money, everybody want a bank account, everybody want to look good on the stand with a microphone. It don't mean anything. More of it is the population of the property that's going on now. 
you know, we're taking jobs from people. People ain't got no homes, no shelters. And you know, I was occupied for Occupy Rochester, you know, and right now I'm a public safety for Square Village, Sanctuary Village, you know, and I'm a veteran too. So like when I hear all this political nonsense, it's like it don't make sense to me because it's like there's really no jobs for no one. You know, like we have to slay ourselves. Like I come from a wealthy, rich family too, you know, but I don't care about that. I'm only care about is just reaching out for everybody and helping each other, you know, because who cares about that president? Because Uncle Sam never cared about you or me. You know, so who cares? You know, by the end of the day, I come to realize that, you know, just hearing different point of views from all you guys, you know, is being who you are. Like this gentleman was saying with nature, you know, this library is historical, you know, like there's so much history here, you know, but it just finally got developed and it took years to do it. You know, because the city didn't want to do anything. And that's when everybody got under strike and a lot of people was getting arrested from my college and everybody was getting thrown in jail. You know, and Cuomo, he's a son of a bee. He don't care. He's from where I'm from. You know, he's a great guy, but I can give a crap about him. You know, but at the same time, he has some point of views that I can agree to disagree on. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh. Uh, we have the room for longer, but we're going to have to stay if there are any questions and discussion. But oh. I have a question. This is really the first time that I've been to one of these meetings. And I just wanted to know, I was going to ask you, Bruce, or whoever, if you could kind of share with us what's happened with the protests so far here in Rochester, where it is now and where it's going? For low wage workers? For low wage workers. Oh, the low wage? The, oh. the fight for 15? Fight for 15. Yeah. Yeah, I, the, the short answer is there will be folks here Saturday morning who are in fact um, workers in the fight for 15 in the afternoon session, <coughs> Kate and I'm drawing her last name. Kate is Craig. Kate Crane, who is the organizing director of the project. Actually, Jake. Jake is going to take her place. Jake is taking. Oh, Jake is okay. Um, from local 200. Okay. Um, they'll be talking about the campaign. I mean, very briefly, um, the numbers keep increasing. There's a full-time organizing coordinator. Uh, paid for by SEIU at Metro Justice, and supervised by Metro Justice locally. Um, there will be another strike date that would uh, take place in early December. We expect that action to be significantly larger than the last one that took place, uh, and there'll be more publicity as that comes up. But uh, it is gaining some momentum. Uh, a large part of the fight for 15 and fast food is because fast food is something that's so visible uh, the thinking is it's the best way to get across our message. There are a lot of other uh, very low paid workers, you know, the Walmarts and the healthcare. And, and in this town, call centers is another area that we forget about. But there's a lot of folks employed in <coughs> Sutherland and other places in low wage call center jobs, which, you know, I just did a lot of phone banking over the election. I think that just makes you crazy. But um, so. So uh, there will be more information if you can make it Saturday specifically. Um, if not, the place to call is Metro Justice 325-2560. Uh, That's the headquarters of it. There is also, um, I just got uh, this afternoon, there is also a meeting at my office, the 1199 SEIU office, at 5 o'clock on Saturday after the afternoon session concludes here. Uh, there's a public education session on the Fight for 15 in the context of the history of the labor movement at 1199 headquarters. We are at 259 Monroe Avenue, that's the old Sears building, on the second floor. And that meeting is going to take place uh, at 5 p.m. in our main meeting space. <coughs> Anyone knows any fast food workers who would be interested in joining us? Um, it would be good to have their names. So I don't know 
who might have a relative, a friend, a neighbor, but if you do and you can give a name, it's easier to contact them outside of work than it is to go inside the Wendy's or Burger King and risk having the manager find out what you're doing. So uh, it would be really an advantage if anyone, if anyone could give any names and phone numbers. Thanks. Only once. You can only twice. Uh, so, we're done. Thank you all for coming. I think it's been a really helpful discussion. Thank you, Ted. Good job, Vince.